Hey everybody, it's Garden Sound, and welcome back to Theory in the Daw. I hope everybody's drank their coffee today, because things are about to get complicated. This is our first lesson that's going to actually be completely inside of the DAW, inside of Ableton in my case. Now, as always, this is a partnered series. If you'd like to see the entirety of my lesson and have some cool tips and tricks specifically for Ableton, check out Live Producers Online, link in the description down below. They're currently running a promotional offer for a 30-day free trial membership. I'd highly recommend that you click my link and check it out. I've been getting some pretty good comments on these videos with great questions. If you would like to be part of that discussion or ask me a question or if something doesn't make sense that I've mentioned, I really want people to learn. So don't hesitate to go down to those comment sections and ask me a question. Okay, so today we're gonna to be talking about what notes go together. This is gonna be called Harmony 101. And if this episode is popular and you all like it, we share it, everybody's watching, I'll make a second episode, Harmony 102, and we'll go into a bit more detail on some things. Today we're gonna to go through every single interval in the 12 tone equal tempered world, okay? Inside of the 12 steps of our normal Western scales, we're gonna go through each individual interval, talk about its strengths and weaknesses, and how to combine them to make better harmonies. We're not gonna be talking about chord progressions or tendency today in depth. That'll be in the next episode, so if you're thinking about chord progressions or tendencies specifically, hold on to your horses, we'll get there. If you haven't caught up with this series as of yet, go ahead and click the link at the very end of the video that'll have last time's episode for Theory in the Daw. This is our fourth episode. Here we go. We're gonna start on C, not for any particular reason, just because I think it's a great place to start. So here we are, C. C3 to be exact. And what we're gonna start to do is add notes to play with this C, talk about the distance between those two notes called the interval, and then talk about its strengths and weaknesses. The interval is the distance between two notes. And this can be relative to whatever we're talking about. And we're gonna start with the most obvious one, the half step. Okay, so this is C and C sharp. This interval isn't very commonly used. And there's a good reason for that. It doesn't sound very good. The reason it doesn't sound very good is because the notes are so close together there isn't enough space for our ears to really tell that there's a huge difference between the two. This interval sort of wants to resolve upward. Um, now, this can be a powerful tool if you're trying to create an uncomfortable dissonance. Um, it, it's kind of uncomfortable. In fact, this is the interval that was used in the Jaws theme. You know, da, da. That is a half step. It's also called a minor second. This interval is going to be called one, meaning that there is one half step or one semitone between the two, or a minor second. Now let's move up one more half step. Now we have a major second. Now this is going to be either called two or major second. And these two notes are C and D. This interval is slightly more pleasing than the last one, but not too much more. Still not enough distance for us to have some sort of a harmonic um, sense about it. Uh, typically, this interval isn't going to be used much either. But again, if you're trying to create a sort of uncomfortable dissonance in a song, going between this one and the minor second, or one, is gonna create that sort of feel for you. Let's move up one more half step. Now we're hitting the minor third, or three, meaning three semitones. This one is our first interval that has a definite harmonic nature to it. Listen. Now, a lot of people at this point are gonna confuse the term minor with sad. And what minor means is of the two thirds, right, this being the minor third, it's smaller in distance than the major third. That is all it means. Don't get them confused as one of them is less significant because it's called minor. You're going to use the minor third a lot in music. In fact, a lot of music in minor keys is going to revolve strongly around the minor third because the minor third is the root of the minor triad, which we'll get into a little bit later. Let's move up one more half step. That's the major third. It is a third. It is a major third because it is larger than the minor third. And it is a third because it's using the first and third scale degrees. For instance, in the C major scale, as we talked about last time, or as we would talk about in any sort of major scale, we have C, D, E, right? Third note, there you go, major third. This is just like the minor third. 
in that it's the root of the major triad. It's the root of the major one. You're gonna use this one a lot as well. These both sound very harmonically pleasing. One half step away from the major third is the perfect fourth. This one is a little hollow sounding, just like the perfect fifth. And the reason for that is that the ratio in terms of frequency between C and in this case F, it's very, it's very, very nearly perfect. It's very nearly whole numbers. So the, the harmonies beat, meaning that their waveforms um, align in a very pleasing manner, but it leads to it sounding hollow. You can stack perfect fourths to form what's called a quartal harmony. In fact, I talked about that a lot in my How to Write Space Music video, which I'll link below. This is called a perfect fourth or a five, if we're talking about set theory numbers. Let's move up one more half step. This is the tritone. It has the strongest pull other than the major seventh in terms of tendency, which we'll talk about in next week's episode. The tritone is unique because it is used to, to resolve five, which would be, um, in this case, in, in the key of C, which would be G major. It's used to resolve five to one, the most powerful chord progression in all of Western music, used most commonly. This is the tritone. It's very dissonant. It does not want to stay where it is. Very displeasing to the ear. The tritone, or six. Let's move up one more half step. This is the perfect fifth. Like the perfect fourth, its ratio in terms of frequency from the fundamental to the fifth is very, very close to a whole number. Again, it sounds hollow. This is also called quintal harmony. If you stack perfect fifths on top of each other, you get really cool effects. I also talked about that in my space music episode linked below. The perfect fifth is the outside edges of a triad, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this episode. This is called a perfect fifth or a seven in set theory numbers. Let's move up one more. This is the minor sixth or an eight in set theory numbers. It is related to the major third. If you take a minor sixth and invert it, you get a major third. Or vice versa, if you take a minor third and invert it, you get a major sixth. Let's take just a brief second to talk about inversion. Inversion is where you take one of an interval pair and put it either up or down an octave. Check this out. G sharp to C is a major third. So we can go right back, pop this up an octave to how we were a second ago, minor sixth, and you can pop it down, major third. Pretty cool, right? The opposite is true as well. If you take a minor third and invert it, you get a major sixth, and if you take a major sixth and invert it, you get a minor third. Now we're at the major sixth, and we just talked about octave inversion with major sixth. If you invert it, you get a minor third, but this particular one is also known as nine in set theory notation. The major sixth is not very commonly used. It's pretty static. It doesn't really have a lot of tendency to move. Um, it's just important that you know what it is. Minor seventh. This is one of my favorite intervals. The minor seventh is so melancholy. It just kind of wants you to remain in place. It's a very jazzy interval. That would be a 10 in set theory or a minor seventh. This is gonna be the major seventh. It has a very, very strong pull. In fact, this is the only tendency we're gonna talk about today. If there's one thing you learned today, I hope it's that you learned that the major seventh wants to resolve open to an octave. Listen to how strong this pull is. Where does it wanna go? To here. Again, this is the major seventh, extremely jazzy. And then the final interval, let's move up one more semitone. This is the octave. Not the most important interval, very easy to understand. It is C to the next fundamental C. Now let's talk about how to put these intervals together to create harmonies. The most easy and apparent way to do so is just to add another tone. So let's take it back down to our first most harmonic interval, which was the minor third. There is one more note that we could add on top of this that would sound great. It's the perfect fifth, check it out. Isn't that cool? So the difference between a major chord and a minor chord is how much space is between the first and second notes, i.e. the interval. 
Remember how we talked about how a major third and a minor third? They're both thirds, but one of them is farther apart. It's the major one. Check this out. That's a minor chord. That's a major chord. All you need to remember is whether or not that first interval is a minor or a major interval. These are called triads. Triads because there's three notes inside of the ad. Triad, I don't know what ad means. Maybe ad is the assembly or something. I can't remember my Latin stems. I'm sorry. If you wanted to extend the harmony, extended harmony, extended tonality, boom. You could extend it by a minor third or another major third. Let's go with a minor third for a second. Ladies and gentlemen, my favorite chord. Oh, it's just so melancholy. It's, it's so relaxing. And, and, and you can put it into a big synthesizer and you get this big kind of wash of like, oh, I should relax. Because there's a lot of no tendency happening. The minor seventh doesn't want to go anywhere. The minor third doesn't want to go anywhere. The perfect fifth doesn't want to go anywhere. All three of those pair together perfectly to create this washy kind of chord that just doesn't want to go anywhere. Listen. Ooh. Oh. Anyway, I'll get off my horse for a second. All right, let's move on to another chord. I'm going to remove our seventh. The major triad. Again, that's just making the initial interval a major third. Now, let's talk about diminished triads. First of all, let's go back to the concept of major triad versus versus minor triad. A minor triad, remember, has a minor interval at the at the at the root, right? A major triad has a major third at the root. A diminished triad has a minor triad in the root and a minor triad built off of the second interval. Take a look. Minor third, minor third. Put them all together. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a crunchy kind of chord. It's not very jazzy. Again, this is kind of used to create uncomfortable dissonances. Diminished. Okay, now let's talk about its brother, the augmented triad. An augmented triad, if, you, if you're ahead of me, you probably already know what's gonna happen. Instead of being two minor intervals, is gonna be two major intervals. Let's set that up. Major third. Major third, together, augmented. Interesting, you can have augmented chords with a seventh on top and vice versa, we could also add a seventh to a diminished chord. I'm giving away a template to everybody who's watching the videos over on Live Producers Online that'll have sort of a cheat sheet to remember these intervals. Um, if you haven't signed up for it or checked it out yet, links in the description below. 30 day free trial, highly recommend that you go sign up. Lots of great downloads and tips and tricks available on liveproducersonline.com. As I said earlier in the video, if you have a question, leave me a comment down below. I've been pretty good at getting back to people when they have questions about the theory stuff that we've been seeing in these Theory in the Dollar episodes. And I do my best to make sure that I respond to everybody. So please leave me something below for me to discuss with you. But that's gonna do it for me today. Again, my name is Garden Sound. This is Lyle the Bird, who was asleep a second ago. Intervals have put her to sleep. Great. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this episode. Love you guys. I'll see you in the next one.